Good evening and welcome to the North Idaho Board of Trustees meeting tonight on October 27th, 2021. We will call the meeting to order. We will have a verification of the quorum. We, we have four uh, trustees, so we have a quorum. Ken okay. Howard here. He's on the phone. Have, have we had a sound check all, with both trustees. Trustee Barnes and Trustee Howard to know that they can hear us well and that we can hear them? Where Mr. Carr started. Trustee Barnes, can you hear us? Trustee Howard, can you hear us? Trustee Barnes, can you hear us? Trustee Howard, can you hear us? Not hearing from Trustee Howard either. That doesn't look good.
All right, Trustee Barnes, can you hear me? Trustee Howard, can you hear me? Okay, it's a good one. Steve Bond, Okay, we'll push Howard, can you hear us? Not letting Michael Barnes join. Right. We have a call. I just don't trust you. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and start and we'll bring those both on when they come on, but the first couple items are okay if we start to move through them. So we have a quorum, we have three trustees, so we can begin the meeting, we can add uh, Trustee Howard and Trustee Barnes as we go. So <clears throat> would you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody, I believe, has had a chance to review the minutes. Um, Trustee. Mackenzie, did you have something that you wanted to say? I, I do. It's short. Uh, recently, the boards made some very important decisions. Recently, there you go. Thank you. Re recently, the board has made some very important decisions. And I was looking over the prior minutes that we tabled last month. And uh, I've watched each of the videos and I've uh, made some expanded versions of the minutes. Um, that I include uh, what I believe to be uh, vitally important details and context uh, resulting from the discussions of those uh, minute by minute from the uh, record. So um, I just believe these details and context are important for future records. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, might be a little unusual for the board to do this, but I'm going to make a motion. It's a bit long, so bear with me. Uh, Trustee McKenzie has reviewed the meetings in detail 
listening to all of the recordings in their entirety, and has created an expanded version of the minutes. I recommend approval of the minutes as prepared by the secretary and to have the longer version prepared by trustee McKenzie be included in the board record. And that's my motion. Do I have a second? Oh, I'll, I'll second that. All right, do I have any comment? Mr. Lyons. Mr. Chairman, uh, I do want to, I do want to note that, that, uh, Minutes are just minutes. Minutes are not detailed notes of exactly what was said and done at a meeting. They are just summary notes to reflect the actions taken by a governing board. In this case, the actions are typically the passing of motions. The motion language should be identified correctly in the minutes and the votes should be recorded accurately in the minutes. There can be a little bit of, of context, if you will, that just simply indicates discussion was had. The details are actually not necessary. If someone wants to hear the details of the actual discussions and see the actions at a board, what happened at a board meeting, they can go and review the audio visual record. The audio visual records for the last number of uh, meetings are available, but the audio visual records of the minutes are not and should not be the minutes. So, Unless a motion was not accurately stated in the minutes or a trustee's vote was not accurately recorded, no amendment to the, to the minutes is necessary. So um, you know, trustee um, McKenzie's, um, um, I think elaborated, uh, extended um, uh, additional context as, as he saw it, uh, being uh, placed in, in the board records is simply there, but they are not the approved minutes. So that's all I have to say. Yeah, we're not, we're not making an amendment to the minutes. Uh, we're just having some additional information that will accompany the minutes and will be included in the board record. Are there any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please vote aye. 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 Hello. Well, well I, vote, I vote aye. I think that's, that's Michael. I, I'm not sure, but motion carries to the majority. Who do we have there? Is that Michael or Ken? Who's speaking? Uh, I, I just spoke, Ken. Ken, okay, thank you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, let's go ahead and start with the constituent reports, if we could, please. Uh, we will, wait a minute, I need to back up a second. More... Uh, Dr. Burns, if you would, please uh, celebrate. We are not going to present the celebrating success night on the dental hygiene program. We will say that for a future date. Thank you, Dr. Burns. All right, uh, now we move on to the constituent reports. Uh, the first one is ASNIC, please. Good evening, board. Um, I have great news for you uh, for about ASNIC. And for the past two meetings, we've been reviewing survey that students um, went through and um, here are the projects that we look through and their potential of researching and actually making it happen. The first one is recurring each year, ASNIC annual spring student survey, improve participation numbers. We would like more students to share their voices and what they would like to improve, uh, what ideas and what they wanna see in NAC to happen. Also academic best practices resolution. Uh, we do have draft and we would like to uh, finalize that draft. It's about a better communication between faculty and students and uh, that faculty will um, follow the syllabus and will keep it straight forward and the students will, will be easier to understand for them what they're expected of. 
Uh, next is food and vending machine improvements, uh, something that we had conversations for, for a long time and we would like to keep those conversations and improve food on campus and uh, for uh, better quality. And outdoor seating actually was mentioned a lot of times. Uh, facilities have a project and ideas how to improve the outdoors and we would like to collaborate with them and make it happen, uh, provide some ideas. Also decorations in the classrooms and um, safety on campus. Uh, it's getting pretty dark right now and the campus is not well um, light in the evenings. We would like to have conversations with the security department and see how we can improve that and maybe contribute as a group to make it safe on campus. Also make beach more accessible for people with disabilities. There's something for conversation to have and uh, improve campus community, more events, better contact, advertising alerts, engage of campus students, uh, particularly is SendPoint campus. We would like to reach out to the, that group of students and maybe have a special events for them. And some small uh, projects like awards and recognitions from ASNIC to students, discover students who are worthy to get a small award and recognition for what they do. Maybe they're not part of ASNIC, but they're part of creating making this community better. So um, also we are working on um, Kutney Hospital request. They requested to create a graffiti, um, thanking the hospital workers and healthcare workers. And I created a design for that. It's been approved. And um, we also hospital provided um, spray paints and um, all expenses are covered by hospital. So we're working on that right now. I'm open for questions. Trustee Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Annie, you talked a little bit about, about safety on campus yes. and the lighting issue. And I know it's probably been mm, probably at least eight or nine years since we had a, a grant, I think grant funding that paid for some additional lights. Um, and I, I'm actually gonna ask Chris Martin, put him on the spot right now. The, at the time, the lighting was very specific and I don't know if, if the students have come up with an area they're concerned about. No, they were just saying about entire campus. Um, there are some lights that lead to the dormitory. Overall, it's pretty dark outside. So there, there are areas that are lit in, um, at, around the sub and um, I believe gymnasium. So that's uh, pretty light, but other than that, it's pretty dark. Okay, Mr. Martin, do you have uh, anything to add about the lighting we did install? Or what you see as improvements? I would just share that we're happy to collaborate with ASNIC on that. And um, just recognize that our security department um, 18 months ago did an audit um, of all the lighting on campus. Um, and we have worked to remove the, um, the canopy around some of the trees to make it lighter. And we've replaced a lot of the lights with the high powered LED lights. But to, to Annie's point, we're not finished and have more work to do. So between working with ASNIC and security, um, we will definitely be happy to collaborate on how we can improve the lighting. Thank can you. I, oh, are you done? No, that's it. Well, I had a question along that point, I guess. I do have another question for you, but uh, how, I wanna to try to articulate this question correctly, because, but how, how many security personnel do we have? And the question I'm leading to with that is, because of the expanse of the campus, and we have certain traffic corridors, whether it be to and from the sub, to and from the gym, maybe to and from the student wellness, rec uh, student wellness and recreation center. I'm guessing we have a certain number of officers that are rotating and patrolling on foot and hitting those different areas at some regular interval of some sort. And I, I don't want you to give me your, you know, your plan, you know, you don't need to release that per se, but kind of give me a generalization of how we've got that handled. Sure, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. Really proud of what our security department has done over the years to improve campus safety here. There's seven full-time staff that are a part of that now. There's a safe walk program that provides assistance to students coming to and from vehicles in the evening that's been heavily promoted and a number of students are utilizing. We run shifts both here and at the, uh, the other satellite offices in Post Falls and now that um, out at P-TECH as well. So we feel like we have really good coverage, have backup coverage. And so I think we have a good safety plan in place. I think you'd be pleased. Okay. And could you just, you know, Reader's Digest version, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but 
Tell me again what you're doing with the spray paint. Oh, what? yes. So it, the saying will be- <laughs> Security is listening. No, I'm kidding. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the idea is uh, to create a saying that says, we love our healthcare heroes. And just to thank all healthcare heroes and people who work um, in that industry. And, and um, it will be a, basically the wording with some patterns and the words on the street. It will be um, near Kootenai Health on a north, um, I believe, north entrance. So it'll be near that so area. On the asphalt. Yeah, itself. yeah, the asphalt. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Annie? Just a comment. It, I got the impression that you had a list of action items from the security. Could could you two connect and maybe she'd be able to report those action items to her people? Uh, I'm sure you were already planning on it. Uh, Trustee Howard, can you hear us? And do you have any questions, sir? I can hear you. I don't have any questions. Thank you. You bet. Trustee Barnes, can you hear me? And do you have any questions? I can hear you. And no, I do, no, I do not. All right, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Trustee Howard and Trustee Barnes, I will not do that to you every time. I just want to make sure to hear your voices and that you were both uh, receiving and able to send. Thank you, both of you. I would and like to add something about the security. Uh, we, we were supposed to have uh, a representative from the security department to come at our Tuesday meeting and uh, give us update what they were working on. Unfortunately, it didn't happen last Tuesday meeting. This actually Tuesday meeting. But we'll, we're working on that and we'll be connecting, collaborating. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, our faculty assembly. Good evening, um, Board of Trustees, community members, special guests, faculty assembly passed a vote of no confidence for this board of trustees. Next up is staff assembly, it's Sarah Martin, and I believe she's gonna come in remotely. I am, okay. can you guys hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, okay. we can. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, Chair Bindici, other trustees colleagues and guests. Uh, staff assembly met on October 14th. Uh, we were able to cover the usual uh, order of business. We were fortunate to share new employee introductions and welcome some new cardinals that had joined the NIC team. Um, I am also excited to share the Sterling Silver uh, Award recipient for the month of October. Uh, it went to Neil Doyle from IT. Uh, Neil is the outreach technology coordinator and he assists with the IT help desk. Uh, Neil's service has been a tremendous help for those of us who work at the outreach centers. Um, his service is greatly appreciated. So congratulations, Neil. Uh, we also invited Dr. Uh, uh, Pres the acting president, Dr. Lita Burns, Burns, and members of PC to spend time with staff and address specific questions and concerns that staff had in regards to the current state and transition from former president through the interim and ultimately selecting a new president. Discussion centered on the morale and how we can attain and retain positivity, uh, how we can remain resilient as a community within NIC by supporting one another, uh, by also being intentional with that support and fulfilling our mission and values. Uh, we also extended a uh, period of time, we, sorry, we extended additional time to make sure that we were able to fully address all the questions that staff had. Um, I would like to give a, another thank you to Dr. Lita Burns, Rail Anderson, Laura Rumpler, Karen Hubbard, and even the PC members who weren't able to speak. Um, just their attendance um, and just that show of support really does mean a lot for staff. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the meeting uh, didn't, then transitioned over to the great benefits and opportunities that are provided through the NIC wellness program. Um, it's a great opportunity for employees to stay motivated and taking care of our health, not just physically, but mentally as well. Um, employees here at NIC, we are currently participating in a STEPS challenge. Um, and we were also able to share some fun activities and events that are going on around campus. 
uh, with the goal to help bring some fun, laughter, joy to our staff, um, as well as we provided a, an update to the We See You initiative. Uh, with the We See You initiative, uh, we are going to be highlighting Siebert Hall. Um, we will be focusing on um, all of the success stories, highlights, and the amazing work that is produced um, by the various departments that operate in that building. We will, we will be sharing that celebration at our November staff assembly meeting. So hopefully in November, I can share the stories with you all then. That concludes my report and I stand for any questions. All right, trustees, does anyone have any questions? Oh, Sarah, I don't see any and I don't hear any. So thank you very much for your report and you have a, a good evening. Thank you, you as well. Next up, Senate. Thank you, Chair Banducci, uh, Board of Trustees, President Burns and assembled guests. Uh, the Senate had their second reading of policy 5.09, which we eventually tabled to uh, spend a little bit more time looking at the language. The Senate also had first reads of policy 3.0205, which is employment of related uh, parties, as well as policy 3.0212, um, professional consulting, and for procedure 5.09. Uh, that's the work we conducted in the Senate this week. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you. Questions, trustees, anyone? Jeff, I don't see or hear any. Thank you very much for your report. Next up is the president's report, uh, Dr. Lita Burns. Please. Thank you, Todd. I'd like to begin with sharing some of the happenings, the fall happenings on the NIC campus. Um, NIC held its first music concert on October 5th, since the beginning of COVID. So that's a really long time ago. It was called the Fall Choral Invitational. I hope that many of you were able to attend, but for those who didn't, I'd like to share just a couple of highlights. Um, the invitational part of this uh, concert was that Max Mendez, our choral director, invited Coeur d'Alene High School and Lake City High School choirs to come join the NIC choirs to conduct this performance. It was absolutely fabulous. All three, um, four or five groups, in addition to a five piece brass band performed, it culminated with a combined performance of a piece of music where all of the students, I would say over 130 students were on the stage in Boswell and the quintet to uh, provide this very beautiful piece of music uh, I get chill bumps even just thinking about it because what was so beautiful was so many students working together to create and perform music. It was absolutely outstanding. And I, I give a lot of credit to Max and the choral directors from both high schools for making that happen. And I'm just gonna give a little plug uh, for anybody who has not attended any of our concerts to please get there um, this fall, this winter, and in the springtime. The music is absolutely wonderful. As many of you know, last week we celebrated homecoming on our campus during the men's and women's soccer games. And HR also hosted for us a harvest soup luncheon, which was just delightful. And a lot of employees attended both the homecoming and, and the soup little festival activity. Our men's and women's soccer teams have been in full schedule and on a full schedule this fall. They've only had to cancel one game this fall and both of them are performing very well. We expect for both of those teams to be able to go in postseason play. So looking forward to that. I think tomorrow night they're playing in Spokane if I'm correct. Yes, thank you. Um, our volleyball team was off to an amazing start, winning as usual. Um, and then unfortunately uh, had to miss a number of games due to COVID. Uh, we are hopeful that they'll get a few more games in before the end of the, the scheduled season, and uh, we're expecting them to perform every bit as well as they started out. That's a nice sort of segue into the next topic. Uh, Chair Banducci requested that uh, we provide a little bit of update on our COVID numbers and how we manage COVID on our campus. And I have asked Alex Harris to do this 
for us. He leads up our rebounds team, which is the COVID response team here on, on the college. And so he's going to provide a short presentation for us. Thank you, Alex. Chair Banducci, members of the board, President Burns, Barrister Lyons, it's a pleasure to be here tonight in front of you. Uh, Dr. Burns had asked me to provide a, uh, an update on where we are with COVID. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the um, number of employees here that have been working since almost two years on the rebounds team to talk about all things COVID at least once a week if not more, and then also our student COVID re response team made up of about 10 employees who uh, do the contract tr tracing for our students and our employee contact tracing team, which is made up of one. Thank you, Melanie in HR. Um, all their work, um, it has been amazing and it's been on top of what, what they're already expected to do. So I just have a, pre a brief overview. First two slides are um, some numbers, what we've gone through and then an overview of our protocols. So I know the numbers may be uh, a bit small, but the beginning of the graph on the left would be August 30th of 2020. And uh, all the way on the right would be uh, a week and a half ago when we had our latest numbers. And those are new files of students dealt with by the student uh, COVID response team. That means anyone who has self-reported as positive, anyone who has uh, reported as a close contact, or anyone that has reported uh, COVID-like symptoms that um, and have not tested yet. So those are the number of cases we've dealt with um, over the past year and a half. Uh, as we can see, we had uh, quite the spike this fall. And I can tell you good news. I just saw the numbers today, so I didn't put them in here. We're still trending downward for the last week. So. And this is the same chart, but it represents uh, positive COVID cases by week uh, for students. So the other one were all the cases that we have to manage, uh, the, the time missed um, by our students um, out of class or um, opting for Zoom if they're well enough to do that. And uh, these are the ones uh, that are positive cases. So again, I, you know, really to me, this shows the work that's been done by a lot of people on our campus and uh, we're doing pretty amazing things. We have a weekly call with uh, all the state institutions in the state of Idaho, Wednesday morning, seven o'clock. And that's what we get for being in the North. They get it to work at eight and can come on. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're right up there uh, with what we're doing to help protect our students. So there's been some questions uh, and Lita wanted me to explain, sorry, Dr. Burns wanted me to explain um, what we do for protocols, just a brief overview. Um, so the, the first line of defense is self-monitoring. So students, employees, they monitor their health every day. And if they have symptoms, they need to stay home, just like we were always told before. Um, it's just more serious now. And uh, so we ask them to do that and we ask them to um, give us a call or their, if their employees give their um, HR a call, if they're exper experiencing any symptoms or if they test positive, or if they've been exposed. That information goes to our contact tracing teams, which is the student response team and Melanie and HR, who then go through um, the contact tracing process over the phone. Um, uh, the whole team went through a course through Johns Hopkins University to learn how to do this way back in April or May of 2020. And everyone's certified to do that. Um, so that's a bit of what we do. So what results of that is really um, some of the nitty gritty of the questions we get. So if a student is positive, they're put in isolation or employ for a minimum of 10 days from the onset, onset of symptoms. Um, if they're symptom free um, by day 10, then they're coming back. A student is quarantined or employ for an exposure to a positive case. And that's for 10 days from exposure. Uh, and that's for unvaccinated. If they're vaccinated, uh, they have to monitor for symptoms, but they don't have to quarantine. Uh, and if they're symptomatic, it's 10 days 
just like quarantine, but they can come back early with a physician's note or a negative and a negative PCR test. So all these we didn't make up. Uh, we had no COVID experts at the start of this. We still don't have any COVID experts at the in the middle of this, um, but we go by the CDC recommendations. And this follows what uh, all the other institutions in the state of Idaho are doing. A uh, couple other of the protocols that we have, we continue to have reduced capacity in our uh, ground travel. So bands, buses, uh, to allow for three feet of distancing. Uh, we ask that they wear masks in the vehicles and um, obviously roll down windows or air conditioning or whatever they can do. Um, and the last one, or sorry, not the last one. Um, so we have instances like uh, clinicals for our health professions programs, and those students are required to follow the protocols that we have and then the facility standards, which are often higher than what we have. And last but not least, um, we continue to have um, a redu reduced capacity for large event venues on campus. Uh, the main ones that come to mind would be Schuler Auditorium and Christian Zoom Gymnasium. And we currently have that at 50% capacity. I stand for questions and that yellow banner at the top is at all of our website, every website page. And so you can always go get the most updated information there. All right, uh, trustees, any questions for Mr. Harris? Alex, I'll ask one. The limitation on capacity at 50% in the venues, um, when do we think that that's going to change? It seems like there's a lot of activities going on and at least locally, I feel like we're the only one that's doing the 50% thing. Thank you, Chair Banducci. Um, as, as I said, none of us are COVID experts. Um, usually the way this is, has worked uh, when it comes to talking about what protocols um, we put in place for the safety of our students and our employees and our community um, that idea is brought back to the rebounds committee. We talk about that. We look at factors, you know, numbers in the area, infection rates, all those kind of things, positive rates, um, and the uh, rates of hospitalizations. And then we make a recommendation to PC. And PC sometimes chooses to accept that recommendation, others they don't. This last time when this was brought up to rebounds, if I recall the discussion, it was really based on the fact that our hospitals were still in. Uh, critical care mode. And uh, the group felt that we had a responsibility to the community still because of that critical care nature of the hospital. So that was the main decision making point on that one. So anytime it, it's brought back to rebounds, we're just an advisory body. Ultimately that, you know, that lands with, with PC or the board. Okay. So reviewed weekly or whenever it happens yeah. to come up. And we meet, topic. we meet we weekly. Okay. So, all right. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Alex. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go on my report. Yeah, yes. So last week I attended uh, a meeting with the members of the Joint Appropriations and Finance Committee and the four community college presidents. The presidents answered a variety of questions asked by the members of JFAC, ranging from CTE programming and funding to how federal funds related to COVID have been spent at our colleges. We left the meeting believing there was great support for the work and the mission of comprehensive community colleges in Idaho. So it was a very pleasurable and important event. I also want to share this evening uh, a document regarding the NWCCU report that will be due August of 2022. Uh, this document is prepared by the Executive Accreditation and Planning Committee at the request of Trustee McKinsey. You have the document at your table in a hard copy, and I also sent an electronic copy out to all the members of the board um, at the be before the beginning of the meeting. Now, I will not be going through every point on this document. It's rather lengthy, but I do want to speak to some important elements in the document. As you know, I am critically concerned about NIC's ability to remain in good standing, a status the college has had since 1950. I met with Chair Banducci on August 24th to discuss with him my concerns about the lack of progress the board has made toward fulfilling the commitments to NWCCU in the letter submitted to the colleges, submitted with the college's official report. 
The report was filed June 10th. The report was NIC's response to the commission um, regarding a formal complaint. I also addressed my concerns about accreditation during an executive session when the board was considering appointing me as acting president. NWCCU requested an ad hoc report focusing on eligibility requirement nine, governing board, and specifically the commitment and actions to be taken by the college's governance and administrative leadership as described in the evidence presented in the board's statement to agree to readdress its roles and responsibilities in relation to college administration. We are looking to the board to completely fulfill the commitment they made to the commission. There is a heavy dark cloud of uncertainty hanging over this beautiful campus of ours. Faculty, staff, and students are concerned about NIC retaining their accreditation status. All departments and divisions work daily to ensure their actions, behaviors, and processes support the mission and values of NIC. That is how accreditation standards and eligibility requirements are upheld. Our employees know that there's nothing more that they can do to protect NIC's accreditation status. Our future lies in the hands of North Idaho College's Board of Trustees. You need to know that students and community members are calling with greater frequency about NIC's accreditation status. We respond by saying, right now, heavy emphasis on right now, NIC is in good standing. Unless swift action is taken by the board, our response will likely change in the near, in the near future. You may think that I am speaking as an alarmist, let me assure you, I am not. I have not served as a commissioner for NWCCU or been a part of their decision-making process, but I have been frontline in accreditation processes for over 30 years now. And again, I assure you, the commission will be looking for a pattern of evidence, not a promise of changing behavior or practices. I and others are willing to assist this board in any way we can to help you fulfill your commitment. And lastly, I want to take the opportunity to thank the board for appointing me as acting president of North Idaho College. It has been an honor to serve the students, the faculty and staff and to work with this board. I have truly been humbled by the support that I have received during my tenure as president. And I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. I wish Dr. Savelli success in his new role, and I offer him my support as the Vice President for Instruction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burns. Are there any comments or questions from any of the trustees on Dr. Burns's report? Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. Thank you. Well, first, Dr. Burns, uh, want to thank you for your service, not just in the last month, but in the decades that you have served in IC, you have been invaluable to us. And I know you still plan to retire in January, um, but what I know about you is that how much you care about NIC. So I think we'll see you, I think we'll see you around. And we'll certainly call you to serve on all kinds of committees as a volunteer. Um, I would just quickly want to question you. Uh, you've given us this um, roadmap on accreditation, which I greatly appreciate. We have some, the last bullet points on the last pages. Seems to me that's what we should focus on. Um, I don't know if we have time before Dr. Burns retires, but I think it'd be worthwhile for the board to work with Dr. Burns and um, Mr. Savali on, in a workshop and focus on what's been presented to us tonight. Any other trustee comments or questions? If not hearing any, I have a couple quick ones. Um, first off, uh, thank you for sharing with 
us about the uh, Corral event. I think that exemplifies the concept of a community college when you have two of the local high school choirs here with us. And of course, uh, Mr. Mendez has done an amazing job for years. Uh, Max is just a, a very nice man. He does a great job with the, with the students. Also, uh, homecoming was a, a big success. I happened to catch the men's game that we won two to one. I'd like to thank those that manned the grill. I sampled uh, hamburgers and hot dogs. So it was a, nice to have the lunch and the visit with many people, several sitting right here in front. So uh, Mr. Martin, I think helped prepare my meal. So thank you, Chris. So it, was, it seemed like it was uh, well attended and uh, everybody had a good time and, and the weather cooperated, which if everybody remembers that day started out a little gloomy and quite wet and the day before. And so the torrential downpours Stopped in time for the women's game. I think they were a little soggy, but uh, it was quite nice for the men. Field was even in pretty good shape, I think, by then. So very good. Thank you for your report. Next item on the agenda is the uh, is under old business tab one, the second reading action to adopt the revised employee benefits policy, three point zero two point one seven, and that's Karen Hubbard. Good evening, Chair Banducci, trustees. Uh, tonight I'm presenting for a second reading, policy 3.02.17 on employee benefits, which was formerly titled fringe benefits. Um, as I mentioned last month, this policy has been reviewed by HR, payroll, and President's Cabinet and has gone through two readings at the Senate where it was approved to bring forward to you. Um, as this is the second reading of the policy, I'm requesting the board uh, consider a motion to adopt the proposed revisions. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Trustees, are there any questions for Karen Hubbard? Is Trustee McKenzie. Has this board not been responsive to adapting policies uh, with regards to benefits? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the question is exactly. If you could, if you could rephrase that, tell me out. The, well, the, I'm noticing that the policy goes from two pages, which lists out detailed one through seven, um, the types of benefits for employees down to pretty much just saying employees by offering a competitive employee benefits package. So I'm just wondering why, I mean, has there been something like, for example, re retirement plans that have been asked for of this board that this board has not timely responded to? No, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, Trustee McKenzie, I think what you're you're seeing are a couple of things. This um, the policy that we're updating is um, quite outdated. You can see that its effective date was in 2000, and at that time our benefits looked a little bit different. And so did perhaps the approach to writing policies, uh, where now we um, we tend to write our policies with a general statement and provide a lot of details and process in the procedure. And we've moved that content that's currently relevant into the procedure um, to be consistent with our approach to writing policies currently. Um, in addition, some of those benefits aren't currently relevant. Um, and so they have been excluded from that procedure because of that. Um, we did add a, an additional procedure that spoke specifically to uh, retirement plans so that we could make sure to include and clarify that information for employees. Um, and, uh, and the rest of the information related to current employee benefits, which are evaluated each year and um, put forth through the, the budget process in the spring. 
And that's what, what you would see each year as a board in terms of employee benefits. Yes, that's where I just take issue with as in things can just change in a procedure on a whim with no input. The board only has policy input. So I guess I just disagree. Mr. Chair. Chair. I'm sure if I do it too, when you get a chance. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Trustee Barnes. Yes. Hi. I agree that policy should be very short and concise statements. Um, I also understand the concern of, of a, a radical reduction of um, the former policy to the current one. So my question is, um, are, th do the current procedures now um, include all of that uh, information? I think the concern is to make sure that uh, uh, those affected uh, are not being slighted by any of the benefits. So do we have access to those uh, procedures that filled in what was redacted? Uh, it's my understanding that the procedures were provided to the board. Um, if that wasn't in this month's packet, it may have been in the previous month. I would ask maybe the clerk if she could con confirm that. Yes. Mr. Chair. Trustee Barnes, did you have anything further? No, no, I do not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trustee Wood. Um, I, I think, well, this is our second reading. And I, maybe the confusion is that the board does not approve procedure. Uh, and so uh, this is just one of the normal policy updates that are brought to us on a monthly basis. And so with that, I would make a motion to adopt policy 3.02.17. All right, I have a motion. Are we in, can I say something? One moment, please. I do not have a second on the motion. Okay. Can I, I provide board second? The motion to approve is not seconded. So I don't know if there's any required discussion at this point. Do we know if, if uh, Trustee Howard can hear this? Oh, okay. So we've got four board members here. Mr. Chair, seems that we'll just just sure. we'll, please. All right, um, I do not have a second at this time. Uh, I, I will give one comment since I've not spoken on it and then we will move on. Um, Karen, I understand the need for the update on the top half of page one. That all makes sense because you're right. It's, it's way out of whack. It's 21 years old and the new terminology and everything makes sense to me. I think I'd like to see personally, some sort of compromise. How, how, how many pages are the procedures normally? About three, four, five, six pages? Do we know? They vary, Trustee Van Ducci. Okay. Um, they, they vary greatly from one to the next. So because they're more detailed, and they go more in depth and have all the, the breakout and all the information. That's correct. What would be nice, I think, is a policy that can stay short, one to two pages, but does have the highlights of the, of the, of the topics, which they do have here, that are relevant and still current, and maybe just the quick synopsis like you have for us, and then you can have the accompanying procedures that expand on those. 
Does that, does that make sense? Would that be a compromise between the two? Rather than me getting down to one sentence, I'm down to something short, updated, and then we have the procedures to back it up. Is it, is it, am I making sense? Sure. We can, um, that, that certainly would be possible if that's the will of the board. Um, uh, just my feedback. I, I think that'd be helpful to me. And um, I don't know whether you, it, it sounds like not everyone has uh, the procedure in front of them to speak to, but it might I be. do not. Okay. Um, I don't know that anybody does, to be quite frank. It doesn't Chair appear. Chair Banducci. Yes. It, it, if Barnes. I may, yeah, if, if I may, um, as I said, I do believe that policy should be short and concise and, and uh, uh, directive uh, from the executive level um, as a policy should. I just, yeah, wanted to see a policy a little bit more uh, fleshed out than the, just a, a, a one-liner. And so I kind of agree with you, Chair Banducci, that it'd be nice to see a, a little bit more meat to that policy. Okay. All right. That, that would be something I could more vote towards. Okay. Um, I think we're there. Okay. okay. Uh, we will revise and um, re return this policy to you in a future future meeting. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair Banducci. Thank you. Chair Banducci. Dr. Burns. I, I just like, would like a point of clarification, I think to help, um, help us with the many policies that we will be bring, bringing forward. As you know, um, a year or so ago, we uh, adopted a policy that had us review sections of our policy manual um, a year at a time. And so we will be this year bringing forward um, a number of policies um, out of section three. And we probably need some guidelines. I'm curious as to when this was presented as a first reading, it's typically after it's presented for the first reading, the feedback and comments are giving, given to um, whoever is presenting them so that they can work through any concerns in hopes that during the second reading that the policy would be approved. So I'm, I'm just um, curious about if we're going to continue that process and I'm going to suggest we continue that process because um, this now will delay um, the adoption of this policy it, um, and we have more policies coming forward. So I just would like to get some very specific direction from the board um, in regards to the first and second policy. And as you know, when a policy is sent back, not only is the author or authors of the policy, will they go through it, but it will now need to go also back to Senate. And so it'll have to get on the Senate's agenda before it, it um, comes forward another time. So uh, just in terms of expediency and efficiency of both the board's time, uh, especially the board's time, um, I think that we would like some direction. We would need some direction. Let's chat about it right now, if we may. Um, uh, two things, from my point, the, this got put, it was a little bit lower priority for me. We've had a lot of things going on. So I hadn't really looked at it or reviewed it very closely. So I finally got a chance to look at it, but it's been in the myriad of many other things that we've had. So. Uh, so I'll take some blame for that too, to try to get more of a timely feedback. But I would like to review for all of us, for the trustees, because remembering, here's the challenge. In theory, we act as a group and nothing gets done unless there's at least three of us that say it. So how do we, in between meetings, if we review these, I want to review what's the proper procedure for providing feedback because trustee Wood, or Trustee Howard, or Trustee Barnes, or Trustee McKenzie, or, or Trustee Banducci may have different visions of what that feedback looks like or different versions. So I'm trying to think how do we coordinate this feedback process and how do we submit it and to who? What's the entry point? And how do we do it so we don't have conflicting feedbacks? Because um, Trustee McKenzie and I may look at something and we may have a different, again, a different vision as to how we'd like to see it. Um, so um, I'm thinking how we do that and, and do that in an orderly manner. Trustee Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, practice is and policy dictates that it's done in open session in the first reading. And as the board, we coalesce as best we can under discussion, and then we send back the amendments or the direction we'd like to give to staff. I don't see any other way to do it. We, we're following open meeting laws. We can't deliberate outside of meetings. And so 
we will just do it in open session. All right. And the yes. So that's that's how we're going to have to do it, I think, because again, they're, otherwise logistically it becomes challenging. I don't think, quite frankly, we were some of us were prepared to do that at the first reading, and we kind of went okay, okay, and then we got a chance to look at it after the fact. So that's we. So the process has been delayed a little bit. So the challenge for us as board members is trying to get through the board book and be prepared for things like this and having reviewed it, and be prepared for questions, and then try to do real time during the open session coalesce the comments and, and try to come to uh, uh, to agreement, uh, you know, consensus as best as we can. Yeah. So, so I, so I, I, again, I will bear some of the, uh, uh, some of the brunt of that. I, I know that I was not prepared to do, to do that process at the first uh, I, reading of this. If I may just, provide my input what I would like to see in policies. Are you open to some feedback on this right now? Can we talk about it a little bit? We're in open session still. Is it employee competitive employees package and then it would list out like for example professional liability insurance. North Idaho College provides professional liability insurance for all employees, officers, and board of trustees members. That seems pretty general policy but but that's something that is if it's a benefits then then it basically kind of be recognized as, as so uh, mr chair just do it i would just state per state law we're not allowed to be in any employee benefits we we just simply are not subject to that so we cannot be written into policy well, then let's update this policy then. I, I'm, I'm not no, saying we should, but I'm saying I was just reading it as it is right now. No, I understand. Um, but we just are not allowed in any way, shape or form to, to be subject to any employee benefits. Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, Trustee Wood is, is accurate in that and you cannot get benefits. You cannot be on the, on the insurance. You cannot get employee benefits as trustees mm -hmm. at this college, because yeah. that would be uh, some uh, financial monetary uh, benefit. I think what, what Trustee McKinsey question goes to is, 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 is there DNO insurance? I think that's a separate question. That's not an employee benefit. Uh, and frankly, I don't know the answer to that. And, and if, if that is something that, is, that needs to be considered by the board, frankly, I don't think it, it, it is much of a risk, but he would have to ask Vice President Martin, and whether we do have that, I don't know the answer. M Mr. Martin, sir, Chair and Ducci, members of the board, we, we do provide that um, for for the board because so that is a coverage that is in our iCrimp policy. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, um, is there any other feedback for Karen at this time regarding this policy? All right, we will move on to the next agenda item. We are now under new business. We have an action item here, selection of interim president. Uh, that action has taken place and I am uh, pleased as the board chair to introduce our soon to be new interim president. It's been selected, but the contract is yet to be executed in the timing. Uh, Dr. Michael W. Sabali, PhD. Board Chair Banducci, trustees, assembled guests. Oh, I, I said that wrong, I'm sorry. EDD. EDD, my, my mistake, sorry. I am humbled and honored to be standing here today. Um, I applied for this position because what we do at North Idaho College matters. I appreciate and I'm so thankful for all that the faculty and staff do here. And I will listen to you and I will be visible and I'll support you. North Idaho College is about access and opportunity. And that's important to me. And I live that and it's my passion. I have students on a team that I'm coming from that wouldn't be in college if it wasn't for what we do here and the opportunity and the access that we give. And I am so thankful and excited to be working with some great people. 
I talked with Rael today and uh, I, I'm excited to work with the foundation because raising funds and that fundraising eliminates barriers to attendance. North Idaho College and our accreditation is important to making sure that students and learners have those opportunities that they need. Know that we are here for you. I'm thankful to the board for your passion. What's going on shows that you care, that this community is important. And what separates us is very little compared to what brings us together. And I look forward to working together to support and bring this community together. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Dr. Sabali. Pardon my mistake. <laughs> I don't have a doctorate, so. Next item on the agenda is an action item regarding the approval of the presidential search firm. It's got my name by it, but I'm not sure I'm the one that starts that discussion. Who's... I'd be happy to start it. Well, um, who's the who's a faculty for that, or who's leading the? It's we don't have a faculty for that. It's just to decide on decide on we need to decide on what time we're going to do. Okay. Okay. I don't know if it's the opening. All right. Well, I know we put out some solicitations for organizations to help us with this search. And we've been given information on four search firms. And I guess I'll open it up to comments and questions regarding uh, the four search firms. So do any trustees have any comments or questions to start off with? Trustee Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate the four uh, different vendors that have submitted the information. I think probably any of them will do fine work. And um, for me, I'm familiar with ACCT just because we've used them in the past and we've used them for training. So I would probably be preferential to them, but I, I think any of them would do a fine job. I also think that the ACCT proposal was the most affordable, if I can recall. Um, so I, I guess I would just recommend that. But I also, Mr. Chair, some of the questions around this is, I think tonight would be important to state how soon we will employ them, how soon we'll pull together our uh, campus community and our community at large to, to have members serve on that search committee. And then of course, uh, board members that will serve as co-chairs on that committee. And then also determining when we want this done by and uh, the length of time before we have a permanent president. Okay. Oh, I've had a chance to look at these, but not in the depth that I would like, but the timeline seemed to be somewhere around a new permanent president targeting somewhere around the 1st of July, I think seems to be kind of one of the dates that I've seen. I think that was even ACCTs. Uh, so I think they're looking at trying to complete the process by the end of the spring term. The pricing, uh, from what I can tell, and some of these have some additional numbers that are in addition to the base numbers, it looks like we're somewhere around $50,000 maybe, plus or minus. Uh, I know one jumped out to start, it said 60, and then there was potentially additional costs. Um, I have not had the opportunity to, to really look at these for myself. I don't know how everybody else has done, but I've been a little preoccupied with a few of the other business items here at the college recently. And I've got tens of hours invested in just the last couple, three weeks. Um, one of the things I was hopeful I had asked, there was a couple of search groups that I did not see in our selection pool. 
uh, that are, I believe, my understanding of what I know of them, uh, one was AGB, and we had tried to engage with them previously um, for some training. As it, as it turned out, we did use ACCT for that training, but AGB was a, a very viable option. That's the Association of Governing Boards. And, and I don't know if we've had a chance to reach out to them. And another one that's a, a nationally known is one called RH Perry and Associates. And I know they're quite good. And I don't know if we've had a chance to, to touch base with them or, or solicit uh, inputs from them. Uh, honestly, I, I'd like to try only to see even if, if the pricing would change. It's, it's pretty high right now. And I'd like to see if we can do anything with that. But I know those are both respected. I am familiar with ACC2, ACCT also, like you are, and, 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 and worked with them. And they did come do some training for us. And I know you and I have been to some of their events. Uh, I'm not familiar at all with the other three, uh, Greenwood Asher and Associates, uh, the Poly Group, and Gold Hill Associates. Uh, I honestly know nothing about them whatsoever. Uh, so I could, I, I don't know how the other, uh, Trustee Wood, Trustee McKenzie, Trustee Howard, Trustee Barnes are, but right now I, I would feel I'm totally throwing a dart against the wall and seeing what it hit. And I would still like to know too, if we can have AGB and or RH Perry as options and what their price would come in at. So I, we have a meeting on November, 15th and we'll be meeting on December 15th, but maybe we could try to target November 15th to pick a company. Uh, and if we can get responses from AGB and RH Perry, I think that would be nice. But that, that's my thoughts. Uh, anybody else have comments or questions? I have comments when, when, when you're ready after the trustees spoken. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Trustee Barnes or Trustee Howard, do either of you have any comments or questions, sir? Chairman Banducci. Trustee Barnes. If, if nothing more than just a, an opportunity to continue to review what we've got and uh, buying some time to see if uh, any of those other, other two or three that um, you'd like to see can chime in, I, I need more time to review those. All Mr. right. Chair. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Trustee Howard or Trustee McKenzie, either of you have any uh, comments or questions? And then I'll go back to you, Trustee Wood. You, you're not well spoke. All right, Trustee Wood. Thank you. Um, I don't have a problem with the two week window to November 15th for a little more time. I do, I am curious though, the process so far, how, how did we solicit, how many replied and how many are available to us? Maybe. Dr. Burns, yeah. could you update us, please? Chair Banducci, Chair Wood, or <laughs> Trustee Wood. <laughs> um, I would actually like to invite Karen up to speak because she did the legwork and, and on this particular project. So um, it was in response to the request to solicit um, some firms for, for you to review. So Karen? Uh, yes, Chair Banducci, trustees. Um, this is where I thought we'd start. <laughs> so I decided. We, based on, on the board's request to, um, to identify some search firms and bring, bring propos proposals to you for this search, um, we reached out to Idaho colleagues around the state and got a handful of recommendations and um, their feedback based on recent searches that they have done for presidents and other executive positions. Um, we identified a handful of um, firms and contacted them. Uh, ACCT was on that list. Um, uh, there were two others that uh, declined to submit a proposal to us. Um, we also, uh, we considered because we've had recent experience um, with AGB, we considered contacting them and chose not to, both based on our own recent experience and based on feedback from colleagues around Idaho. So um, from there, uh, we, we also um, responded to an incoming request, someone who had contacted us um, based on uh, what they had seen in the media and um, they, they asked us if they could 
um, submit a proposal that was Greenwood Asher, and that's the one that came in at the top from a cost standpoint. Um, through the process of contacting these search firms, um, we got uh, further recommendations <laughs> as we uh, short shortened our list and didn't quite have the number of proposals that we thought would be acceptable to the board. And um, from, from those recommendations, we reached out to the Poly Group um, and they connected with us and wanted to submit a proposal. So we had a conversation with them as well. Um, and uh, quite frankly, Gold Hill Associates um, was really sort of a, a last minute request um, and we didn't have a chance to connect directly with their consultants, but they are um, a community college search firm and uh, without any specific recommendations. So okay. uh, yeah, that's, how we, that's how we got the list we have. And we had um, three others or three, three in total that um, we reached out to and, and declined. They declined to okay. propose. Yeah, in fact, small backstory between Dr. Burns and I, I completely missed Gold Hill Associates initially. She had told me we had two and we were hopefully getting a third. And then we got them. I said, okay, I, I see the three. And then, and then she came back later and said, no, there should be four. And I hadn't seen the fourth and that figured out that was my oversight because I wasn't looking for a fourth. So I kind of missed that one entirely. Right, that, that was a last minute. Edition. Yeah, so, um, so I have no idea about them for sure. <laughs> yes, Dr. Burns. Chair Banducci, um, again, I understand this is an important decision for North Idaho College in terms of selecting the firm that will help us lead the search for our next president. And we want to select somebody who will be here um, for a long time. And so I think this process is important and certainly would want the board to have the time that they need to review these um, proposals that we have before us. Um, I, I will ask Karen if she could immediate, immediately reach out to um, the Perry, R.H. Perry, I believe, um, firm as well and see if they would get us a proposal immediately. Um, I will though um, make request that um, this is decided at the November board meeting. And I ask that because it takes a long time to do a comprehensive search for a president. We will be, um, as you know, recruiting community members, faculty and staff, and certainly uh, have this led the search process led by our board of trustee uh, members. And um, we have to give adequate time. We actually, in, in, during the request, ask that the firms be able to provide us a, a plan to execute that would really allow us to be naming a president by the 1st of June. We did that very intentionally. And the reason for that is, as you know, we have a, a couple of other key executive positions uh, to, to fill as well. My position as vice president for instruction is, is one of them. We still have a, a dean of instruction, general studies that we need to fill. And it would be helpful if we could have a president named and get the president involved in at least uh, being able to interview the candidates for the vice president for instruction. If we don't begin this and start with the president as early as possible at the end of May 1st of June, it will delay all of the other um, appointments that we will have to make or hires that we will have to make. And so just in terms of having enough time to do this thorough search, I would really urge us to have that decision made for the November board meeting so that we can turn the work over to the search firm immediately, knowing that we are going to get into two major holidays and a lot of people are out and hard to get a hold of and it makes their work even more difficult. So I just wanna make sure that we give adequate time to these um, search firms to do the job that they're planning to do for us. All right. Now, I, I do, um, well, we can certainly target that. Uh, I guess I'm, it's hard to ever guarantee anything, but uh, we can certainly target that. I have no problem with that. I'm just, I know you guys, um, I say you guys, it sounds like we've had some concerns about AGB, but I'll be, I'll be candid. I still think I'd like to see a, a submission from them if we can, please. I think we could do that. Uh, I, 
I, I'm hoping that the negative experience that we had was a one-off. AGB has a pretty good reputation, but now you've said that maybe some folks here in Idaho maybe weren't as satisfied with them either. And they may disqualify themselves or they may not respond or their price may do it for us. But I'd like to see it, I think, as a data point if we could. Okay. If, you, if we could do that. I think then that would hopefully give us six op options and hopefully we can certainly pick one from there and feel comfortable with it. Uh, if we get, if either of the other two even respond. So. Chair Banducci, if you allow me just one other yes. Um, yes, please. comment. In, in all of my conversations with the consultants from these search firms, um, they, they all certainly seem to uh, think that this was um, an, an urgent matter in terms of getting a search underway, given the timeline. Um, executive positions uh, at colleges um, turnover in the summer. And so um, most uh, leadership, you know, <laughs> folks with, with current positions, leadership positions would want to give ample notice to their current institution. And so a decision would need to be made for them um, much in advance of the end of the academic year. And so um, really uh, finishing up the search, um, in you know around the March timeframe or earlier even would be ideal, and uh, they also comment on you know the earlier you start, the better your your pool may be. Okay. Um, the 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 other item that I just want to mention for the board's consideration is um, to emphasize what Dr. Burns shared in terms of the timing of both the presidential search and the vice presidential search, vice president of construction um, that would follow that and that um, if the board intends to stagger those, that we ensure that that decision is clearly documented in our meeting minutes uh, so that prospective candidates for those positions understand that, that the president, the new president will be selecting the new vice president and that that would be something that candidates for both positions would value. Karen, if, understanding that people want to provide the appropriate notice, but then I would suspect even with the notice, if the relationship is right, they would want to complete the term or spring semester or whatever. So a person could come on one June, one not one June, one July, one August. So anytime in the summer would be the movement time. Is that kind of how I'm understanding that? And they would assume in preparation for the fall term to start. As long as they're in place, that sure. I think traditionally presidents start right around the beginning of the fiscal year, and that's when when those transitions are typically made. If you look at the last two um, presidential transitions here at North Idaho College, that would hold true. I believe those were about July one transitions. Okay. Um, and is that and a normal fiscal year for colleges? Because government work. We're October 1st for fiscal year. We do it a little different, at least in the military and that the normal government runs, uh, uh, starts new fiscal year on October 1st. So I didn't know if that was the norm, how we've done it. Cause I think July one is kind of our cycle or that's an educational thing. Or maybe just how North Idaho college does it. It's pretty consistent. In, ed in education. Okay. Yes. And, and so, um, you know, perhaps the incoming president could come on board even in advance of that, which would give them then more opportunity to participate in the selection of, of the vice president. Okay. All right. Thank Mr. You. Chair. Oh, okay. Trustee Wood. Thank you. I think the intention of the board from the very beginning, when we realized we were going to fill the position is we would, we would do it judiciously. The timeline that's been laid out is familiar. Uh, and it would make sense that the search would be done by March, no later than April. We would have time to interview candidates, offer a position. They'd be finishing out their year, their academic year. And then we'd hopefully have them here even by June 1st, sometime in June. We could make accommodations for sometime in June. Um, my concern, I'm willing to go along with two weeks to give the rest of the board more time to look at proposals. I don't have a problem with that. But I did come prepared tonight to make a decision. I did read the packet. So I, I'm really not wanting to go beyond two weeks. We need to get the process started. So that's one of my concerns. And then I, I would also like us to visit the other questions I had for the board that we need to make some decisions about the process itself. 
Okay, did you, did you want to talk about that tonight, some pro the process? A little bit? I would like to. Um, we know we will come together probably in a special meeting and we will work in a workshop environment to pull together constituent groups. And that'll be, that'll be after we select a search firm. Um, but what I think is really important tonight is that we have two trustees appointed to serve as co-chair. And I have said in the past, what I think would be best for the campus, for the community, for the institution would be for yourself and trustee Howard to serve as co-chair. And I, and I don't know that I need to make a motion on that. You know, the board can really just agree that that's the direction we wanna go. Okay. Are you okay just to be in, to discuss it that way? Mr. Chairman, yeah, I think you are for the for the moment because uh, when you're ready to to select the committees, then then the board will have to get together and and, and agree on the committee structure. Okay. Um, is there any comment or question to uh, on that discussion for what uh, Trustee Wood has uh, proposed, uh, Trustee Barnes or Trustee Howard or Trustee McKenzie? Okay, it sounds like we don't have to make- I, I was waiting for, I was oh. giving the microphone. People, Sorry. Phone people. I, I have something I would like to say if nobody else. Uh, all right, Trustee McKenzie. Jeremy and um, I would express an interest of being on that committee. Uh, okay. If the board chooses somebody else, that, that's fine. Uh, it's the board decision, but I wanted to express that I think it's time um, for maybe a new face. Uh, to help choose the next president. Okay. Duly noted, sir. And I, All right. Any, anything else? I would just say with the recent actions is there's a grave difference of opinion um, on who should lead this institution. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure what that means. I, saying, that was I, just a comment that I'm not sure what I that wasn't means. meaning to attack anyone, Chris. I don't know. I don't take it as an attack. I'm really trying to figure out what oh, that please, means. Please, please, just, just a moment, please. Just a moment. I, I don't, I don't know that I know exactly other than I think if I'm understanding just that it appeared to be some maybe some differences of opinion recently in uh, the process that was undergone. And maybe we leave it at that. Um, but Trustee, Bar, uh, Trustee McKenzie has expressed his interest and, and uh, so that's duly noted. Thank you, sir. And Trustee Wood, your proposal is duly noted also. Well, Thank maybe you. we should actually make a motion. If we don't do it at this meeting, it would have to be at the next meeting. Um, no. Nope. Although we don't have Trustee Howard here, so I, I guess I would request we wait till the November meeting. Do, do you know Howard has the time to participate in it? Because he's been saying he's going to be working on the conduct policy for a while and it's been all year. But, but I, don't, I don't know that Trustee Wood can speculate as to the availability of Trustee Howard at this time. And Trustee Wood, you. To your point, yes, Trustee Howard's not on the call with us now. So uh, maybe that's a decision that might be wise to defer at this time. It's fine. Um, I, I don't, I, I'd, I'd like to give him the opportunity to say if he'd like to participate. No, that's reasonable. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, I, I would reluctantly ag agree to do it. I think it's going to take a lot of time. <laughs> It is. So anyway, um, anyway, we can, uh, uh, if it's okay, if there's more comment or question, how about we uh, move on and we'll address that further. Unless there's anything else that you had about the process. Um, I would just ask that that be on the November agenda. And yes. then also that we, after we've select a firm, we coalesce around uh, a date, maybe, and maybe some of that will come with the information they provide us. Okay. A couple of them did have, I, again, in my brief glance, I noticed at least one had a timeline. Yeah. I saw ACCT, because uh, they were on top and they were first and I knew them. 
and, and if I looked at it correctly, theirs was to put the present in place on one July. That, that's why it stuck. And then that does match the fiscal year thing. So maybe that's the normal cycle. Okay, next item is Beth Ann. Oh, I'm sorry, Karen, thank you. Sorry. Uh, Beth Ann Fuller uh, with Head Start. Now, Beth Ann, is this the War and Peace novel night or is this the Reader's Digest novel night? Reader's Digest. Ah. Chair Banducci, board yes, members, Dr. Burns and guests, thank you for allowing me to present the annual review of our first reading of our policy council bylaws. So these that have been presented, these changes to the bylaws include aligning the language with the Head Start Act and restructuring some committees. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about any of these proposed changes. And, and board, if, if you look in your packet, you have the red lines. Uh, it's tab three, there's a attachment A. And uh, there are some, but they're not extensive. It looks to me like some of it was just some cleanup and some clarification. Uh, not too much of it was what I would call uh, substantial, I guess, in, in context. Would that make sense? It was more of administrative cleanup and update? It certainly does. Okay. Uh, do any of the trustees have any questions or comments for Beth Ann? None for me, Chairman Banducci. Thank you, Michael. Trustee Wood? No, no sir. Okay. okay. Beth Ann, I think you're going to get off real easy here. Thank you very much for your presentation, unless there's anything else you'd like to add. No, nope, that's great. Thank you. Do we, um, they're the first reading, so you, you'll ask us to approve this in November? Yes. And that will fit your timeline okay? Yes, sir. I always ask because sometimes we've had to adjust a little bit depending on when the came down from on high of right. move now or you don't get your money. Right. So, so we're okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. See you in November. Next item is uh, tab four, Dormitory Housing Commission. That's going to be Vice President Martin. Chair Banducci, members of the board, just a, a little brief information update tonight, and we don't have to get into the details unless the board would like to, but I wanted just to share a little bit about Dormitory Housing Commission for the benefit of our, our newer trustees. Um, the Dormitory Housing Commission is a commission that's appointed by um, the governor, and they serve in a very unique way at institutions across Idaho. And per statute, the Dormitory Housing Commission can issue uh, bonds to, to build student facilities on college campuses across the state of Idaho. Uh, North Idaho College has had a number of bond issues that the Dormitory Housing Commission has authorized. We have two bond issues that are currently outstanding. Uh, you'll remember uh, most recently the bond issue for the Student Wellness and Recreation Center. And there is a small balance remaining on a series 2012 bond that funded the development of the residence hall. And uh, just, just wanted to come before tonight and make sure there were no questions about this. Um, the Dormitory Housing Commission is, it works in concert with the North Idaho College Board. And so as a little bit of detail, I provided the ground lease that the board approved for the development of the Student Wellness and Recreation Center and a little detail about how that funding works. And so one thing just to, to bring forward this evening is because these are revenue bonds, um, the, the board has authorized the collection of fees that pay off these revenue bonds that the DHC has authorized. So it's a unique collaboration between the board and the commission. Um, and I'm happy to provide further detail, but um, in the spirit of Reader's Digest tonight, uh, I will offer that and we can go into questions if, if that's the will of the board. Chris, I'd like to make sure I have one thing correct that people might find interesting. The Dormitory Housing Commission does not fall under the purview of the college or the Board of Trustees. It's a unique, separate board, strictly appointed by the governor, it has the power to build things like recreation centers and dormitories and things like that, residence halls. And what's interesting is when they come to do that on the campus, in case anybody's wondering what our role was as the board, all we had, what we were asked to do was to agree to let them use the space, the ground, the footprint. So we have to do, as you said, what they call a ground lease, 
and they came out and said, this is the property we want to use. And this is what we're going to do. And, and what we have to do is we have to let them have the land to do it. However, at, at the end of the day, we still have an obligation to make the payments on the bond. That, am I saying it correctly so far? One, one clarification. Yes, please. The, the board has, has to authorize the fee levy the fee okay. that will pay the revenue bonds, but the, the board actually isn't responsible for the bond. Okay. Now, how, through what sources of revenue, Chris, if you would explain, is the bond paid on a, on a, on a regular basis? So, so the board authorizes a, we call it a student use fee or a student union fee that is levied and all of the funds that, that are levied on that fee that the board authorizes is the revenue that is pledged to pay those bonds. And so uh, that, that's that piece of, we have the tuition setting that the college, the board does, and then there's the fee schedule that the board approves every year. And as part of that fee schedule, one of those is the student union or student facilities fee. Now, as I recall, the students kind of levied themselves. I think it was like $100. Was that a one-time fee or is that an annual $100 fee? That is an ongoing fee. It's an annual fee. Um, and that annual fee, um, it's done on a per credit basis. Um, but that annual fee that students pay is what we collect and then use those funds on behalf of the DHC to pay the bond payments. And that's on all students at all, at all load levels and whether they utilize the facility or not. That is correct. Okay. How much of the bond payment are we hoping to get based on fees generated by the student uh, wellness and recreation center itself? Cause I, I know there are fees that are generated. Is there a portion or an amount of that bond payment that we've earmarked that we hope comes from what's generated in revenues from that facility? Or does the student fees pay for it all by itself? The student, the student fees pay for that. All of it? Correct. Okay. So we're meeting our obligation every year to pay that bond right now through just the student fees and any revenues we generate through the center is goes back into the center or how's that work? So, so one caveat there, um, all of the student union activities, the dormitory housing commission activities that includes the student union at North Idaho college includes the student union, the operations of the union, the residence halls and the student wellness and recreation center. That is a lumped fee over the last several years um, to make the coverage ratio required for the bond we have used fund balance that is inside of the dormitory housing commission funds. And so the dormitory housing commission funds, we, we manage those at the college, but they are actually entrusted to the DHC. And so just one caveat there, um, to make our coverage ratio, we have used fund balance the last several years, but all the funds that the wellness center produces, the rec center produces and the union center produces all go towards that bond payment and the operations of those units. The DAC money that you're talking about, DHC money, is that provided to them by the legislature or does that come out of the governor's money? Where, how do they get their pot of money? It all comes from the student fee and then the operations of the businesses that the DHC manages in the union and the residence hall. Okay. Okay. Uh, trustees, Trustee Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chris, if we... If we have a decline in enrollment, it will obviously affect the money gathered. I think that's probably the times that you've had to use the DHS uh, fund. Looking at this is up next on our on our agenda to talk about enrollment. Are we ever in a situation where we may not be able to make those bond payments? Chair Banducci, Trustee Wood, um, we have made that calculation, and the answer is is yes but not for, for a much longer period of time. And so we would have to have a, a much larger significant decline in enrollment than we're currently experiencing. But there is, there is a time period in which if our enrollment continued to fall, we would struggle to make those payments. But it is the way this is currently structured. Um, and one caveat there, the residence halls will be fully paid off in 2022. And so we're currently making an interest only payment on the student wellness and recreation center bonds. So that's a lot of good things happening in a short period of time, but because of the payoff of the residence hall bonds, that is going to give us even further um, room, if you will, before we hit any challenges with, um, with making those payments. 
And so while we have used fund balance, and this is, I apologize, I'm going to be in a little bit of an accounting geek for just a moment. But while we have used the fund balance to meet the coverage ratio, we have not had to use fund balance to fund the operations. And so I think that's an important distinction about how this actually works financially. Well, the, when the residence halls paid off in 2022, then will the funds that have been used to make those payments be reallocated towards the Student Wellness Recreation Center? And then will we begin uh, payments in, in addition to just the interest only? Is that is That, that is correct. So we, as part of the bond um, development, Mr. Chair, we, we already have built into the fact that we will leverage all those funds with the payoff of the Student Wellness Recre Recreation Center. Those are pledged to go towards the, excuse me, payoff of the residence hall. Those are pledged to go towards the Student Wellness Recreation Center. And offhand, do you have an approximate amount of what's owed left on that facility? Approximately $7 million. Okay. And how many, how many more years do we uh, project that, those payments to continue on those bonds? Uh, approximately 25. Okay. So about 20, approximately 25 years, about 7 million. We're doing interest only, and then we'll start to begin principal payments once the dorm, the dorm is paid off. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, board, any more questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right. Next item is enrollment update. Uh, Vice President Stanley. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, President Burns, uh, Bar Barrister Lyons, <laughs> colleagues and guests here tonight, it's uh, my privilege to provide this enrollment overview for you. We do this each semester after the 15th of the, the midterm, the state asks us to report during the fall semester that we snap a look at our enrollment um, after October 15th during the spring semester. And you might recall all of the new board members were seated by that time. We did that on March 15th, that's our census date. So the numbers that you'll see tonight are reflective as of October 15th for fall semester. And that's not necessarily the most important date, although it's a consistent one from year to year. Another date that's not included here, but is, is important is two weeks after the uh, beginning of the semester is when um, students have made payment for fees. And some students don't make it all the way through the semester. Those numbers might be reduced by the census date, yet the payment for their classes and services uh, was made by the end of the second week of the semester. The, Enrollment certainly goes a long ways toward uh, informing our budget. I think all of you probably know that the funding of the institution is based on primarily three sources of revenue. Uh, one third of that approximately is enrollment. Uh, a third of that approximately is state support. And the other third is local um, tax support from Kootenai County. So enrollment is certainly an important part of our budgeting process. And uh, through our Strategic Enrollment Management Committee, we go through a process every year to help inform uh, Vice President Martin and others about what we should set for budget. This last year, we predicted a 3% decline in enrollment based on all the information that was available to us. It was a difficult year to be able to do that because the pandemic certainly put some factors in place that make it difficult for you to, to predict. With a 3% decline in enrollment, that was our goal that was set. And I'm really pleased to announce to you that we met that goal. In fact, we exceeded that goal a bit and celebrated that uh, among our employees several weeks ago that we exceeded our budget projection. The number that you'll see tonight as I move into that presentation shows it's 3.1% decline. So you might believe that, that we missed it by 0.1%, but in fact, as it relates to revenue, we exceeded that at that time, two weeks after the beginning of the semester. A couple other things that I wanna note before we get into the presentation, and that is many thanks to the folks that in, who impact enrollment. Certainly it's everybody who works at the college from faculty to staff, all of our employees have an opportunity to serve in one way or another and uh, obviously impact the number of students who choose to come to school here and stay here and complete their degree. 
I want to specifically point out the work of the enrollment services team, the ad admissions registrar, financial aid, Cardinal Central advising, and a number of other departments. Certainly the work of our faculty where uh, our students spend the, the most amount of their time is in the classroom. And so students getting a quality education is certainly what has them come and stay. And then uh, other members of our team here, uh, it's everything from our custodial staff to our ground staff, uh, uh, every level of the institution that helps support the enrollment and success of students here. So I wanna acknowledge them. I also uh, want to assure you that we always have our eye on enrollment. And uh, I think if you looked at our schedule every week, there's a number of meetings and all of that is focused on uh, recruiting and retaining and completing our students to make sure that they meet their goals that they come in with. Just today, I spent the majority of the day with a number of stakeholders here on our campus with a consultant, uh, a recruitment consultant, Noel Levitz, and we have done some incredibly hard work the last two to three months improving our recruitment and marketing plan from one of the experts in the nation. And there'll be some initiatives that we'll be rolling out here over the course of this next year that shows great promise in uh, adding to our enrollment. There's also a group that's been working for the last year, I believe the board's heard about this before, that's called, uh, we do a lot of acronyms, as you know, in higher education, this one's called CALC, the Comprehensive Advising Leadership Council, and consists of members of our faculty and staff who are working toward providing uh, comprehensive advising so that we're working with students. So many of ours are first generation and don't necessarily speak the language of higher education, don't necessarily come into the college knowing for certain what it is that they want to study or the degree that they want to obtain. Through our advising process, we certainly help them refine those choices and choose a degree that meets their interest and needs. And lastly, there's been some work that has had tremendous impact upon our retention. You'll see when I show you the numbers here tonight that our numbers of students coming in the door has remained fairly stable. The difficulty for us and other institutions has been the number of students who once they're in the door leave before completing their degree. The reason for that often in the last two or three years um, has been the availability of work likely for most of our students outside of the college when they're able to obtain a, a job that pays 14, 15, 16, $17 an hour. Often students will make that choice for uh, the, the employment now and delay their education. And so they'll leave us, go work for a while, and then uh, we're working on them to return. One of the programs that, that is dramatically impacting retention here is called Freshman Year Experience, FYE. And there are a number of initiatives connected with that that align students with faculty, align students with staff, and work hard to make sure they clarify their goals, that they stay in school, that they have the supports needed uh, to keep them in, and that we're able to um, help them complete their degree. So those are just a few of the efforts taking place to impact enrollment. Now I'd like to go ahead and show you some of the numbers. First of all, uh, was just our, and often I compare this, you'll see in slides later on, we look at five-year trends so that you can take out that that was uh, impacted by the, the pandemic and have a little longer range look, and then certainly just a one-year trend. So this one is from last fall and same date again, October 15th to this fall, October 15th. And you'll note, as I said, that we were uh, minus, we, were, uh, we declined by 0.31%. We divide that into headcount, the total number of students who attend the college, regardless of the number of credits that they register for. And then uh, probably a more important number to us as, as you gauge attendance here, is what we call FTE, full-time equivalency. That's calculated by 15 credits. So you could have three students that only take five credits each and they result in one FTE because combined that's 15. You could have one student taking 15 credits and they, they count as one FTE because of their 15 credit load. Thought it was important for you to take a look at that mix as we talked about new students coming in the door and continuing students staying with us. This is that five year trend. So looking from fall 2017 through the fall 2021, and you can see, and it's quite reflective of the overall numbers, a, a 3.1% down. And when you look at the change in each one of these categories, it's not a dramatic difference. On the left, the continuing students, 
the next one there, uh, moving from left to right, continuing dual credit students. The third one, the light green, that's new dual credit students coming to the institution. And there was a, a substantial change. There had been a substantial decline in the fall of 2020. Much of that uh, likely attributable to uh, the impact of the pandemic. And then the last one on the right is new students to the, to the institution. And that's what I was noting when we talk about new students coming in the door. Oftentimes, colleges, colleges have been saying they've had a difficult time getting new students to come to the institution. That wasn't particularly the case. You see that we had um, an increase in the number of new students coming in the door. Let me uh, just show you the, the enrollment by student type. Uh, you know, board members and many of you in the audience that we separate our divisions by an academic or transfer division. Dual credit those students who are still in high school taking classes. Career and technical, many of those on our campus, some out at the Parker Technical Education Center. And then non-degree, those students who often come in and are looking at just taking a few classes, not necessarily achieving a degree. And so those are the four divisions you'll see here. And once again, fairly consistent in most areas. Um, you can see we were 0.43% uh, decrease in academic. We had an increase, as I said, in dual credit that was reflected in the previous slide. We've had a fairly substantial decrease in career and technical programs. The numbers aren't nearly as large, but the percent is a, is a bit larger. And then, and that is spread, uh, one of your questions, maybe anticipating that, is that uh, particular programs, it's really not, it's spread among uh, a, a variety of, and you'll see this by program type coming up in a minute, but across a variety of the career and technical education programs. And then a bit surprisingly, and we're trying to drill into this and come up with the reasons for it, but an increase in the non-degree, we believe, that that is because some students uh, stayed home and didn't go back to their institution that they were seeking to get a degree from and just came here to take a few classes while they were staying at home. Uh, as such, they weren't necessarily degree seeking, not looking to receive financial aid, not looking to get their degree here, but take classes that they could transfer back to the institution where they had originally been or where they're going to. That would be non-degree. And it was a fairly substantial increase. The average credits by student type, I know, uh, Chair Banducci, you've been interested in this and asked about it over the years, too. There, again, there's a five-year trend here. And so average credits by students, when you look across all of our students taking credits, this would tell you on the academic side that uh, this fall, the, the average is 9.94 credits, about 10 credits. Uh, that has changed a bit just over the past two years. It was fairly consistent for the three years prior. Dual credit, uh, you'll note, has stayed close to the same, a rather insignificant decrease there. They take dual credit students who are currently enrolled at the high school at the same time are taking almost seven credits, though, per semester. Career and technical edu education has stayed quite constant. Those students enrolled in CTE programs, often their enrollment is prescribed that they need to be full-time to be in that program. And so they're at that 12 credit or above that constitutes full-time. And that's why you see that 12.65. And then the non-degree, we've talked about a little bit of an increase there, the average credit load of a non-degree seeking student being 4.65 credits per semester. And this is what I was referring to that's a bit reflective of enrollment by divisions. This, this isn't specific classes, but overall, as you know, we organize our classes under divisions. And you can see again, that there's a five-year trend, the year-over-year -year change representing from fall 20 to fall of 21. And the bar on the right-hand side that you'll maybe be able to see gives you a sense of the trend. Graphically, it represents that. So I think... Uh, it would draw your attention to any dramatic changes that are in there if you saw something in our trend lines. There isn't anything here that's particularly dramatic other than aerospace, and the board is certainly familiar with the reason for that, that decline. And so that's the most dramatic one that you would see. Otherwise, they're mostly in that range of 4 to 5 percent, some of them up 4 to 5 percent. You are probably not surprised by some of the increases in nursing, nursing health professions, 
uh, the Cardinal Learning Commons was as a result of some of the programming and courses offered that are in support of FYE and some of those retention programs that I mentioned earlier. Overall, that uh, you roll it all together and it comes back to that um, decline of 3.1%. Full-time versus part-time is important for you to note. We talked about average course load. And so you can see the decline has been steady and following about the same decline as the, the overall decline of students taking classes here. Again, you have a five-year trend uh, in, in part, excuse me, in full-time uh, down 3.1%, in part-time down about 3.6%. Again, I would tell you that I think particularly on the part-time, a little bit of the reason for that decline has been the opportunity for employment, full-time students having the ability to have a, a well-paying job in the community, go to school, maybe take a few more credits and then be classified as a part-time student. Enrollment by age band is an interesting statistic for you to look at. Again, I would note here's a five-year trend. Year-over-year -year change is fall 20 to fall of 21 on the 15th of October. Um, no, no significant. I, there's a, a couple that might uh, draw your attention. You can see the le uh, younger than 19 or younger has had a small increase. Most of that is impacted by the increase in dual credit. Dual credit fall in that age grouping under 19 years of age. Uh, interestingly, that 25 to 29 year old age range has a fairly significant decline. Again, it's, it's difficult to put your thumb exactly on what the reason is. I would point to our economic uh, situation, uh, certainly in the county and in the area, that that age group is certainly at a time where they're interested in earning funds, getting started, and so they're out there seeking employment, and we believe that caused some of the decline in enrollment. The others, again, are fairly close to uh, the trend of our overall decrease. The top 10 feeder high schools doesn't change much from, from year to year. There's one here that uh, um, I'm trying to track down a little bit and uh, get information on and haven't been able to, to come up with the answer yet. We have a counselor that we're closely associated with at Sand Point High School who we're quite certain she knows the number but she or knows the reason but have not been able to touch base with her yet. But as you look at this, Lake City High School um, certainly is our, our biggest feeder. These are ranked that way, Coeur d'Alene High School. Post Falls and Lakeland, the Kootenai County schools that we serve, it would make sense that they would be the top four. Maybe a surprise, uh, probably not to the board, to, but the people in our audience, uh, those students who uh, have obtained a GED, whether they've done that locally through our programs or at one time or another in their life received their GED and have now decided to go to school. This could be a, a student uh, young like me that was coming to college um, and received their GED. And I would count in that if I was coming back this fall. That's always a, a large number of students coming to us. Once again, that one's a bit down. And we, uh, in conversation about that, we believe that the pandemic had impact upon that, both the pandemic and their unwillingness to be in school. Much of the GED is taught face-to-face. -face, and so it was a little bit uh, more difficult to deliver. And then also the fact that those same people could obtain jobs that were available in the community. The one that I was uh, singling out with Sandpoint High School is a dramatic decrease. And we're unaware of from a, a course offering standpoint um, or anything else that's impacted that. They've been a, a substantial feeder into our institution. And you see that they've declined almost 33%. So we'll get more information, be able to analyze that and then hopefully turn that around. It may be an anomaly just in terms of their enrollment also at Sandpoint High School. Chair Banducci. Do you mind if I ask a question? Oh no, please. Are we seeing a relational decrease in our, our campus, specifically in the Sandpoint area? with the drop from the Sandpoint High School? Is that a one-to-one a, a -one type correlation or, or not so much? You know, we didn't so separate out and I, I would refer to President Burns if she's more familiar with that. We didn't separate out for this report, those students who were taking classes in our off-campus center in Sandpoint that way. Um, it's difficult sometimes to obtain those numbers because we often look at students by where they're from. And so if they're from Sandpoint, but taking classes here, it reports as a number here on campus, even though they're from Sandpoint and a number of them do commute. Uh, President Burns, do you have a reflection upon the, the off-campus center? 
Chairman Kinsey, I would uh, tell you that the decrease in students at Sandpoint really reflected the same de decrease, the percentage decrease we've had on campus and uh, looked at it a lot, the COVID impact, but not dramatic as compared to. What we see from the high school itself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chair Van trustees, you know, uh, dual credit has been certainly an, an important part of our instructional and service delivery. And so looking again at the top 10 feeder high schools for dual credit, uh, it would follow, I, I imagine your expectations that Lake City High School is one of the top ones, Coeur d'Alene High School, Post Falls and Lakeland, again, those Kootenai County uh, stakeholders, Coeur d'Alene Charter, St. Mary's, Bonners Ferry, Orofino, North Idaho STEM Charter, and uh, Rathdrum, and then homeschoolers as well constitute uh, uh, that in the top 10 of our feeder high schools. Um, changes that you see in smaller high schools, like there's some dramatic changes when you look at Bonners Ferry and Orofino and North STEM Charter. Those are fairly small numbers, and often what will impact that is all of a sudden they've asked us to deliver a course that wasn't available before. So if we take one course, and it enrolls 15 or 20 students, like a math course that they're unable to deliver, a calculus course or something like that, with low numbers, it dramatically impacts the increase that you would see. Certainly in Lake City and Coeur d'Alene, a number of those students are coming to campus here and getting the classes that they need. When you look at Orofino, Bonners Ferry, those are being delivered to that area, and they're often dependent upon the qualified teachers that are in the area that can teach our classes. Um, and the courses that the institution wants us to offer in that area. Large increases result from uh, us being able to deliver a course, having a qualified teacher, and it hadn't been offered previously. Graydon, if I may. Yes. On the top 10 feeder, I saw Timberlake broken out. On the dual credit, is Timberlake uh, lumped under the one category of Lakeland altogether? Chair Banducci, it is not. Lakeland particularly has an extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary strong academy that encourages students to enroll in dual credit. And so theirs is particularly strong because of the administration, the counselors, and the community pushing that at Lakeland High School. Timberlake's not even on the list. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's just, it's really a philosophy of the administration and faculty at Lakeland High School that pushed that strongly. And that has been the case for a number of years. They've been a leader in the delivery and availability of dual credits for their students. Okay, thank you. This trustees, we think is an important slide uh, uh, that, that demonstrates, we believe from our point of view, the adaptability, the flexibility of the institution to deliver courses to students in ways that they could access. So again, um, moving from left to right, and it's not a period of five years, but what we wanted to reflect here, modality is the way that we deliver courses. There are primarily um, three different ways that we do that. Uh, it's indicated here by the red line, face-to-face, -face, that's the traditional of delivery of courses for students coming to the campus, attending a class, having the in in instructor up front. Hybrid courses where students have a combination of coming to, to campus being face to face and also being able to do some of their coursework online from home in a virtual format. And of course, online you're likely familiar with, which is not needing to come to campus and being able to access their, their courses from home in a virtual environment. Uh, what this certainly demonstrates is the um, I was trying to think of the word we, we use. That's not the flip, but it was one that was used a lot about how we turned around our instruction during the course of the pandemic. And so you can see as we went to spring of 2020 and March is when that hit, that the institution here, particularly in the instructional division, but also the services had to flip in such a way so that they could still provide coursework and provide services, but in a virtual environment based on the, the conditions that were present. So you see all of a sudden that the face-to-face -face, uh, dove considerably and that the hybrid and the online increased dramatically. Certainly what we discovered at that time was there are a number of ways that we can deliver instruction that we didn't, what we previously knew, uh, this kind of put us into a situation where, where we had to be creative and our faculty and our staff were incredible in responding to that. 
What we also found out is how dependent our students are up, upon having face-to-face -face instruction. Our students need, our students want, our students deserve face-to-face -face instruction. And so as soon as we were able to, you heard from Alex Harris tonight about our response to the, the pandemic and through that work, uh, we were able to turn things around as quickly as possible for our students. Beginning with the fall of 2020, you see face-to-face -face come back. You see a bit of an increase yet in the hybrid, and you see a decrease in the total online. So sort of starting to return to more of a traditional delivery. And as we move further through this and been successful uh, uh, in, in our safety efforts here as well, we've continued to flip back toward that more traditional response. In the bar graph on the right, I would note for you that if you look at spring of 2022, that hasn't come yet, but we know how the courses will be delivered. And you can see that we've returned to near traditional levels of face-to-face -face at 57%, that we have 16% of hybrid, and then we have 26% of online. And so as you see this graph, I think it represents well our response to the pandemic. And Mr. Chairman, trustees, I would be glad to stand for any questions. Board, does anyone have any questions or comments? Yep. Give it a second here. You want to hear anybody from the phone side? All right, Graydon, thank you very much for Great. the presentation. Oh, thank you very oh, much. Sorry, just, just a moment. Uh, You're fine. Dr. Burns, sorry, I didn't see your hand. I just want to make a follow-up, uh, provide some follow-up data. At the September board meeting, I presented a report on transition to COVID and, and uh, different factors. I made a comment, it was an observation of mine in terms of the number of students who have withdrawn from um, North Idaho College based on information I get on a daily basis. And I said, I wasn't certain about it, just kind of my observation. Uh, Trustee McKenzie did ask me if, if, I, if we could provide data um, against what I said, because my feeling was, was that we were losing more students uh, completely withdrawing from school, not from individual courses, but completely withdrawing from school uh, this more this year than we had last fall. And I am able now to provide numbers for Trustee McKenzie, and I was incorrect. And so I'm actually pleased to be able to provide these numbers that I was not correct in that. Uh, last year, we in the fall, we had up through census date, which would have been the 15th of October, we had a withdrawal rate of uh, about 5.6. And uh, this semester, up to census date, we've had a withdrawal rate, a total withdrawal rate of 4.7. So uh, um, uh, over a full percentage point less of number of students completely withdrawing from college uh, from the time they started in August to our census state of October 15th. So I think that's really very good news. All right, thank you for the update. Thank you. All right, uh, one question. Oh, sorry, 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 uh, Trustee McKenzie. It's probably a question you can't answer now, but do you have any projections of dual credit instructors and, and like the rate that they're being added? It looked like there's large percentages and it's all based on like, how goes that recruitment? Um, you understand my- yeah. I, I, I do, no, I certainly heard it. Thank you, Chair Banducci, Trustee McKenzie, and I'm going to pass the, the buck here to my instructional counterpart. Mm. We're all pointing at Lita at this point. Feel, feel uh, there, there's, a, there's a definite process in place and some optimum numbers that we look at for dual credit. President Burns can certainly address that. Chair Banducci, Trustee McKenzie, North Idaho College, in relation to all the other um, high schools and colleges areas that serve dual credit, we, we really do it differently than many of the other areas because, because we have uh, three large high schools in our area that are within driving distance to North Idaho College. Um, the greater percentage of students we serve in dual, dual credit, we actually do serve either on campus or online through, um, through directly through North Idaho College. But to more specifically answer your question, the high schools usually provide for us the courses that they are interested in providing at their high schools. Based on that request to us, um, they may or may not also offer us 
uh, instructors on their campus who they believe are qualified. Uh, when they submit those names to us, then we ask uh, those, faculty, those instructors at a high school to provide us uh, credentials, their resume, and we determine whether or not they actually are credentialed to be able to teach the course that they're interested in teaching. If they are, we certainly make that arrangement with the faculty at the high school. And if they are not, we work really hard to find a way to provide that course for those high school students uh, based on the need that the high school has identified, the high school counselors have identified. Thank you, Dr. Burns. Dr. McGill, all right. Thank you, VP Stanley. <laughs> Stopped and started you there a couple of times. Um, the next item on here is, on the agenda is an action item. So this is a selection of additional supplemental board legal counsel. Uh, it's a topic that uh, I've been researching and investigating a little bit, gathering some information. Um, at this time, there is nothing to present or to report on that uh, regarding any progress in the, on that. So I'm going to uh, move on. The uh, Next item is the uh, board chair report. I'll say it correctly. Uh, welcome to Dr. Sabali, and I'll stop there. Um, I guess what I would say is that I would hope that the NIC community and the greater community here in, in the Coeur d'Alene, Post Falls, Dalton Gardens, Hayden Lake, you know, you know Rathrum, Athol, Spirit Lake, Kootenai County. I would love to see everybody uh, coalesce around Dr. Sabali and, and support him and, and, and in the ways that they can to help him to, to succeed and to be successful and, and to, uh, to lead this, uh, this good college of ours. I, I think the future here is, is, is bright and I, I think he's uh, gonna be an excellent uh, leader for the college. So I just hope that you will wholeheartedly uh, support him in that endeavor. The next item on the agenda is the remarks for the good of the order. Uh, are there any comments from any of the trustees? Uh, Trustee Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would, um, I would share in your sentiment that we need to welcome Dr. Savali. The decision's been made. Trustees may differ in process, but we have no reason to be anything but kind and welcoming to Dr. Savali. And so I, I would encourage everyone to do that. Thank you, Trustee Wood. Trustee McKenzie or, or Trustee Barnes, I'll, I'll wait a moment in case either of you have anything to say. Okay, not to put you guys on the spot. Oh, you do also. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Burns, you have something to share. Uh, Chair Banducci, members of the board, I am actually going to call on uh, Vice President Stanley to uh, provide an announcement for us, and it's a really important announcement. I really like this big buildup. I'm going to wait for just a second and let the tension build in the room. Do you do that? And now, if you're ready for it, do you do it from there or do you go to the chair? Van Ducci. Uh, no, I'm going to do it just from here. Okay. Thank you, trustees. President Burns, thank you for this this opportunity. It is my pleasure to uh, announce to you that we've completed our recent search for a replacement of our athletic director. Bobby Lee left us. Um, a couple of months ago, we assembled a group of important stakeholders here of representing our athletic department, our student services department, the instructional department, all of those folks uh, with a vested interest, certainly in athletics, to be a part of a search. We are especially pleased, and I think it indicates the, the value of our community and the value of this institution and that athletic program that we had a large number of highly qualified candidates who sought that position. We went through an extensive screening process where we narrowed the search down to uh, six, then we narrowed it down to three, went through a series of interviews. Um, I had the good fortune just two days ago to be able to, to make a call to um, one of our candidates. The top four was certainly a difficult decision. Um, and it is my pleasure to announce, and you'll likely see it in the paper the next day or two. We, uh, let, I'm building up the suspense, if you can't tell. Um, we announced it to the members of the search committee and to the athletic department. They certainly needed to know first. But it's my pleasure to announce to you tonight that our new athletic director is a gentleman by the name of Sean Noel. 
Sean is uh, most recently from uh, New Jersey. He has an extensive background in uh, the administration of athletics and recreation, which is a part of that job with our student wellness and recreation programs. And nearly all of that has been in a community college setting. He has great uh, experience and enthusiasm for this position. President Burns had a chance to interview all the finalists as well, as, as did I. And I think uh, we are so pleased that we were able to offer it to him. One of the things that I'd like to share is uh, one of the statements he said at the very end of his interview was, I am really looking for a place for my family and I to call home, that we want to stay in one place for quite some time. He has uh, two young children and a wife, and they are so excited. They were here eight years ago in Coeur d'Alene, couldn't believe how pretty this place was. And so coming from New Jersey to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, he shared with me today that he just found a house in Post Falls. That means he's really committed. He's gone that far and signed the lease. And so we're anticipating on December 6th, join in us will be our new athletic and recreation director, Mr. Sean Noel. Very good. Thank you very much for sharing that. Sean, if you're listening, welcome. It's back East. It's getting a little late. Uh, is there anything else for the good of the order? All right, hearing none, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Everybody drive safely home. Thank you.